I wonder just for these next three weeks, uh, until Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, Kuzan we've been learning now for a few years together. We're going back to Kuzan it's, it's the most important book of Judaism, the Jewish philosophy is the Kuzan And as the Vilna Gaon said, the whole Torah is based on this Kuzan And But now we're in Elul, and, and part of Elul is to have clarity, to know where we're going with Elul, and to give us a productive rest of the year. So I decided to take a leap, and let's learn about Elul, Tshuva, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, things that we need to get into the proper headspace. And the Kolo now, we've been doing the Orot Tshuva, the book from Rav Kook on Tshuva. And, and I figured that Thursday we'll also do in our class for Tshuva. Because this is a smaller class for the good, it's more intimate this way. I feel like I could teach things that I normally wouldn't teach elsewhere. In English, it's not in English, it's in Hebrew. Not only is it not in Hebrew, it's out of print. And in order to tell you how important this book is to me, I want to share with you a story. It was 2012. Sivan. Not Sivan. Yeah, Sivan. Sivan. June, no doubt. And had just met Dwarah in Jerusalem. Wonderful day. The person in Tzfat set us up. Oh, okay. But we had met in Jerusalem, and after a few dates, we were at a point where both of us have rabbis. I have Rav Peretz, my wife had the stolen Rebbe, and we were not going to go forward unless we received the blessing of both of them. So we buy the stolen Rebbe, I got to meet the stolen Rebbe, and then we wanted to go see Rav Peretz, but I was coming back to America, and time was very limited. And so I figured I was going in to get my last smicha test. And I thought it was going to be an audacious move, a little bit of chutzpah. I asked Rabbi Peretz if I could bring a date to the last smicha test. And he said, of course. And so I took my smicha test under pressure because not only was Rabbi Peretz testing me, but so was my wife. And he signed my last smicha certificate there in his office. And we spoke, it was very, it was very special, he spoke to my wife. And he told me that we should go ahead. And then he gave us a gift. And there's this book that's been out of print since he wrote the book of Rabbi Peretz on Yom Kippurim, on Tshuva, on Elul. Things that, I don't know how many people have such a copy of the Sefer, but it's called Emet Yaakov, the truth of Yaakov. All of Rabbi Peretz's books are called Emet Yaakov because it's all about the truth. Everything's about the truth, the truth, the truth. And being that I got this book also on the day that I decided that I wanted to marry Dvaran, also on the day that I got my smicha. There, there's a yisod, a foundation that all of our Peretz's Torah is based off of. And it's this foundation that gives us the chutzpah, the, the brazenness to continue doing what it is that we do today. And this foundation Rabbi Peretz puts in the introduction to his book. It's a story from the Talmud. In Masechet Eruvin. Eruvin is all about the Lazar. An Eruv, putting up an Eruv, right? On Shabbat. And this is the foundation, one of them, of Hav Peretz's Torah. And it's as follows. Amar Rabbi Yoshua ben Chananiah. Rabbi Yoshua, the son of Chananiah says, Pam achat, once, Haiti mahalech baderech. I was walking along the road. I was traveling. You can imagine if you had to go to Los Angeles, you would have to walk there. Can you imagine this thing? So it would take you a few days, you would sleep over in different places along the way. So he was walking, who knows where he was walking. And there was a way, a road, it was like a shortcut, going through someone's field. And I was walking on this road through the field. Amali Tinoket Achat. And I was approached by a young, he calls her a baby. A girl. Uh, tinoket could mean any small child that could speak. She said, Ribi, Rabbi. Lo Sadehizo? Is this not a field? What is she trying to say? Not about an Eruv. 
trespassing. You're not walking on the road. You're walking through somebody's backyard. So it's a big backyard. Are you allowed to walk on someone else's property? Well, it depends if it's section one. I said, I'm going in a way that it's a path. I didn't make this path. Thousands of people have been walking down this road. What's he trying to say? Everyone does it. But everybody walks through this field. Why are you picking on me? Amali, she told me, Listim shekamocha kifshua. Thieves, robbers like you, have made this into a public path. So the Gemara says. Now Peret adds his note. Lehemor, this comes to tell us, Im harov listim, shodadi. Most people are, are highway robbers or, or, or gangsters. V'chen b'chol d'chein, sorry. Are we going to always follow the majority? Just because they're the majority? God forbid. And all kinds of evil things in the world. We're not going to justify everything in the world because because everybody has the custom to do this. And this is the foundation that I was raised on by Allah. Just because everyone does it, does not mean it's okay. Just because famous people do it, Rabbi Yeshua is saying. If they know that Garata is, is not just a book of stories, ah, I was walking down the road, it could be Rabbi Yeshua is teaching us something much deeper. I was walking down the w- road of, that's called this world. And I was doing something that everyone does, is what everyone does. I was called out by a Tinoket. Why is it so important that she was a young girl? Pure, innocent. What else? Children say that, like, to like, even even a small child can uh, can distinguish the difference between. You know, when, and when Bilam is called out by his donkey, what does that tell you about Bilam? Yeah, yeah, the donkey is understanding more than he is. There's a certain view that comes. It's not naivety per se, but a simple. When we get sophisticated, we start to allow ourselves to do things that are not okay. Because we rationalize them away with our sophistication. But if you were simple, if you were tamim tiyam Hashem we should be pure with Hashem, simple with Hashem, you would realize like this little girl, how can you walk in someone else's field? It's a simple question. And perhaps in society, she's, she's not just a girl, but she's little. She's like a, a she's not here uh, some other rabbi or a worker in the field. She's not even the owner of the field. We're being... Demanded answers from by the simple people. Which road are you taking? Yeshua ben Chanina is saying, you can't just walk on any road you want to walk on because that's what everyone else does. You have to be committed to a road that's correct. And this is this. Yeah. You were talking a lot about the majority opinion when it comes to rabbis, and even if you you know you have a certain majority opinion, when you come to also, but in a very different way. That rule of majority and minority applied only once in our history. Only once? Only once. Was, no, no, no. Sanhedrin? Only by the Sanhedrin. It only applied by the elders that were appointed by God. Meaning, we're talking about a situation where there's no right or wrong. Now you just have to go based on opinions. If you look in the Torah, when the Torah tells us to follow, this, thank you, you point out a good thing. Because this is the common answer that we used to get critiqued. That students of our parents very often got critiqued this. It's, it, there's a majority in the world. There's a law. You have to follow the law. It's Yechid Varabim, Halakha Kerabim. That the, the minority and the majority, you follow the majority. This is such an important rule that this rule, actually, the acronym of Yechid Varabim, Halakha Kerabim is Yud, Vav, Hey, and Achaf. That's one of God's names. It's the same name that Hashem uses on Yom Kippur, which is why Yom Kippur is called Yom HaKippurim. The first two letters of each of those words are the same letters of God's name. Yud, Vav, He, Chav. It's an important rule. When God ordained this into the system, that majority and minority, you follow the majority. But it's not everywhere. It's not everywhere in the world you follow the majority. And most people think that's true. Only by the Sanhedrin, and only by things. What things? Things you have to do. The Torah uses a word. The Torah, when it tells you to follow the rabbis, 
אם יפלא ממך דבר, if there's something that uh, eludes you, it's a matter that evades you, you're not sure what to do with this. It's a, it's, there's no right or wrong, you don't know what to do. You have two opinions, you don't know which to follow. Ben din ladin, ben dam ladam, whether it's blood, whether it's money, whether, whatever it is that, that you're dealing with. You go to the, the Kohen that is in that day, the judges, the rabbis of that day, and you ask him, and you do a kechol asher yeruchai, you do whatever he tells you, yamin usmol, either right or left. The Rashi says that even if he tells you that your right is your left, or your left is your right, you listen to him. But Rashi is not saying something so clear here. If you, would you ever go and ask, so is this my right hand or is this my right hand? Then what's he telling you? Yeah, two opinions, uh, two opinions both. <laughs> right, you're not sure which opinion to follow. You may feel very strongly inclined towards one of them, but if he tells you go like the other one, you go. Even if it's as clear to you that you would want to follow the other one like your right hand. But in matters which are, are obvious, they're decided, if the Sanhedrin is going to stand up and by a majority vote is going to say, hey, we can get rid of the prohibition of eating pigs, they can go fly a kite. We don't have an obligation to listen to them. Applies to the Sanhedrin. So, that, so it's Here. not like today. Well, to, uh, think about the other alternative. People say, there are people who want to argue, it applies even outside of the Sanhedrin. But you have to ask yourself the question, how do you quantify the number of rabbis? And how do you count? Who counts as a rabbi? Imagine if I get all the, uh, choose an organization, uh, all the Sephardic Center rabbis to sign on something. 200 of us. Are we all sign? But are we all 200 rabbis? Are we all just following one rabbi? So are we all one vote or are we 200 votes? Is it really fair to go based on the number of rabbis? Or is it within a certain group that was already decided that are godly ordained, they're accepted by the people, but there you have majority rules. And you have the famous Zaken Mamre, you know who he is. The elder who goes against the Sanhedrin. I used to struggle with this halakha for a long time. It's the elder who goes against the Sanhedrin, not just because he has his own opinion. The decision was made, and he chooses to stick to his opinion. But that's already, he's undermining the system. But very often when people will tell me, oh, how could you say this? How could you do this? How could you... The majority... Which majority? You're, you're being foolish by calling it a majority. Oh, because this is at the times of Sanhedrin. Very good. You have stories in the Gemara where rabbis were forced against their will to do things because the Sanhedrin had decided otherwise. But today, the Rambam writes in the introduction to the, the uh, Mishneh Torah, the Rambam says that this rule of coercion only applied in the Talmud. But once we seal the Talmud, every Gaon, every leader of his community can decide for his community. But en bed din zeh bed din hashani. No bed din can force the other bed din to accept his rule. But we still use, we still hear people use this rule. The majority, if those are not, the majority of Jews don't keep Shabbat. So do I follow what the majority of Jews do? Very good. This is what I'll say. Rabbi saying, my job as a Jew is to analyze the truth. The truth today is our deciding. What is Hashem really asking for me? And if Hashem is really asking for me, based on what our rabbis tell us in the Torah, this is what Hashem wants, so it doesn't make a difference what everyone else says. It's robbers that led the way in that field. We don't have to walk down the field just because everyone else is doing it. But this ability to be independent will cause someone to be very lonely. But this loneliness is worth it. It's worth being lonely and being right than being with everyone else and being wrong. Our rabbis say, Lo rabim la'ot. And The Torah explicitly says you don't follow the majority to do bad. So, this is the founding principle on which we were raised. With that in mind, I want to share with you a few things about Elul. The gematria of Elul, someone tell me, the numerical value. The, the, the gematria. You have an Aleph, which is one. Lamed is 30. So you have two Lamids, that's 61, plus Vav Elul, 67. The gem- What's the first letter of Aleph? Aleph, oh, sorry. 67, right? The gematria of Bina. The word Bina, what is Bina? It's also 67. 67. Yeah, 67. Perception, yeah. right? Right. To understand. Really, it's also 67. The same gematria of Elul is Bina. This month is all about introspection. Looking into yourself in the name of Elul 
is this desire to look into yourself, to figure yourself out, to really understand where am I going in life, what is the path that I want to choose for myself this year. <coughs> there was a Hasidic Rebbe who used to say, I believe it was Rav Levi Yitzhak Abraditchev. He used to say that Hashem is not allowed to write on Yom Kippur. He's not allowed to. Because he made a rule that you can't write on Yom Kippur. Can't, uh... He can't write against us on Yom Kippur. The only time you're allowed to write on Shabbat or Yom Kippur is to save a person's life. He says, therefore, the only way Hashem can actually write us down in a book on Yom Kippur is if He signs us down in the Book of Life. Because He's only allowed to write us down to save our lives. <coughs> Bina, perception, to know, to really understand things, to understand what the season is all about, to really acknowledge. There's a story going around the Hasidic WhatsApp groups. Imagine. But they stole it from Rav Shlomo Kabach. It's just they were afraid to say his name. Rav Shlomo used to be very happy in these days of Elul. Dancing, singing. They would tell him, Rabbi, you're not afraid. You're not afraid you're going to come to the judge. He's going to judge you're going to live or you're going to die. Shlomo used to say, I found out a secret. So the judge, it's my dad. He's going to save me. He's going to... But, but you still doesn't excuse you from doing tshuva. What it does is just understand that it's a little bit of simcha that goes on here as well. Bina, as it says in the Nevi Yishayel, let's open up to Yishayel 6.10. Look. Is it in here? Uh, Yishayel, take this prophet. Here. Isaiah 6.10. Six ten. Page nine sixty four. Our it says that the reason why Elul is connected to Bina, because Bina is found in this verse, the word Bina, perception. If a person, unless the Jewish people were internalized in their heart, ulvavo, my heart, yavin, the root of yavin is the same root as bina. On page 964, three lines down, from the top, see where it says. Chapter 6, verse 4. 10. Okay? This people is fattening its heart, hardening its ears, and sealing its eyes, lest it see with its eyes, hear with its ears, and understand with its heart. The word understand in Hebrew is the same root as bina. Yavin, vishav, verafalo. So that I will repent, it will come back to Hashem. Vishav, the word vishav is the same root as the word tshuva. Verafalo, and he will be healed. Rabbi says the first thing to know about Elul is to know that this is a month where everything can be fixed. Everything can be healed. We just have to be willing to use our hearts to internalize in our message inside of us that we need to do tshuva. We really were not happy where we are right now. When we speak about Elul, so Rachel pointed out the famous acronym of Elul. Ani ledodi, ledodi li. I am to my beloved, and my beloved is to me. This is a verse from Shir Hashirim. If you want to look it up, it's the Song of Songs, chapter 6-3. We know that it's a mutual relationship that we have with the Kadesh Bukhu, like a husband and a wife. And I think if we were to sit and think about for a moment what it means to be married to Hashem, it's not that we are, are Hashem's slaves, we're married to Him. Uh, marriage, Hashem married us. He gave us a ketubah on Mount Sinai. He took us through the desert. He kept us alive until today because we're His wife. Even if we're bad and we do bad things, so at the end of the day He's in a committed relationship with us, but not just committed. In a loving relationship, anila dodi vododili. In the Hasidic works, especially in Chabad Hasidut, this month is referred to as the month of Hamelech Basade. The king is in the field. Hamelech Basade. The reason is the king is coming to look for us. It's a time where even though we want to return, Hashem wants us to return just as much as we want to return. But there's something that people don't really know, says our parents, that if you look at the acronym of Elul, it is anila dodi vododili. 
but the sofei tevot, the ending letters of Elul, ani ledodi vedodi li. What are the last letters? Well, it's yud, ani yud at the end, ledodi yud again, vedodi again yud, li ten. Our oh, Pira says it's 40, 40, 40, 40 days from the beginning of Elul until Yom Kippur. Yeah, yeah. And as you know, our Rambesh tells us that these 40 days are the days that Moshe Rabbeinu spent on Mount Sinai. The second time I went up. These, are, these are the days that Moshe Rabbeinu was up there and he came back. Remember I spoke last year right before Rosh Hashanah Kippur that Rosh Hashanah is a universal holiday for non-Jews as well. The Yom Kippur was the day of the golden calf. That's why we're not allowed to wear gold on Yom Kippur. That's why we don't wear golden jewelry on Yom Kippur. That's why we, we're very afraid about referring to the, the golden calf on Yom Kippur. It's all about that, that Moshe Rabbeinu came down on that 40th day and we were uh, cheating on Hashem, on that relationship with Hashem. We just got married to Him and now we were, we were somewhere else hiding. And that's why Sephardim have the custom to say Slichot for 40 days. Because for every one of the days that Moshe Rabbeinu was up on Mount Sinai, we're trying to do a tikkun, we're trying to fix what it was that went wrong the first time around. Well, we weren't married yet. I think like we were like engaged. <laughs> yeah, we were. Okay, Rachadra, we didn't get the ketubah yet. But we were engaged. So this is the first time he went up. The first, first time. time. Now if you look in Nitzavim, Rachat Nitzavim, Which is in the book of Dvarim, verse 36. So go to Dvarim 36, I'll tell you what page it's on. It's on page 500. It says in, in verse 5, your God will bring you to the land which your fathers, it was promised to them, they inherited them. And you will become greater than your fathers. And then it says here, Umal, and Hashem will circumcise. Mal, like from the word Mila. Umal Adonai Elohecha, and Hashem will circumcise et levavcha, your heart, vet levav zarecha. And the heart of those of your children, meaning circumcision removes something which covers. Hashem is going to remove the cover on our heart, so that you'll be able to love Hashem with all your heart, with all your soul, in order so that you may live. Look at the words that Hashem will circumcise your heart. The et levav in the heart of your children. Yeah. The acronym of those words, Elul. Elul is a time where Hashem wants us to remove anything which any obstacles that are between us and Him, to get close to Hashem in a way of love. This is the time where umal. It's a time for brit milah. It's a time to get rid of the anger or the struggle. It's been a long year. We've been through all kinds of things this year. But now is the time where we have to make up with the Kaddish Baruch because very soon we're going to have to come to court with him and to talk to him and have an honest and open discussion about our life. Now is the month to, to remove any coverings that are on top of our hearts. How do you remove the coverings that are on top of your hearts? For that, our parent sends us to Parshat B'Shalach. B'Shalach Paro et Ha'am. This is the time where Paro sends us out of Egypt, remember? So if you go to chapter 16 in Bishalach, verse 5, so you're on page 174. This is the parasha where Hashem sends man, the manna bread, down to the world. 174. V'haya b'yom ha'shishi and it was on the sixth day, Vehechinu et Asher Yaviu, they prepared what they brought. My Tanakh is missing some letters here. Veha, what does it say there? Vehaya. 
והיה משנה על אשר ילקטו יום יום. And it would be double what they would pick every day. The word here for preparing... What? I know, it's a, something wrong with the printing. V'hechinu את אשר יביאו. These words... V'hechinu את אשר יביאו. So we see that a person was preparing on the sixth day for the seventh day, right? The sixth day of Friday, how do you prepare for Shabbat? You buy things on Wednesday, Thursday, whatever it is, Friday you're cooking, so you can have food for Shabbat. What happens for a person who doesn't cook before Shabbat? What does he have on Shabbat? Nothing. 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 Maybe some crackers he has in his cabinet, but what does he have really? Nothing. He filled the fish in a jar, maybe. What does he have? How Pena says, if you count from Nisan, Elul is the sixth month, and Tishrei is the seventh month. And therefore, this is the sixth, the sixth that Hashem is talking about. Ve'echinu, you're going to prepare the sixth month for the seventh month for Tishrei. If you want to have a meaningful Tishrei, you have to prepare an Elul. It cannot be that you're starting two days before Rosh Hashanah. Oh, let's do some kaparot, atarad darim, let's do... It has to start before that. That's why slichot are so crucial. To get yourself in the zone, in the mindset, if you're not preparing now for Elul, then you're not going to be ready. You're not going to be ready for Rosh Hashanah, people. You want to have prepare for Tishrei now. That's why Hashem is giving us this month of Elul to get us ready for Tishrei, like it was hinted to in Pashat B'Shalach. What kind of things are you supposed to fix in, Pashat, in, in the book of Elul? In the month of Elul? The book of Elul. Let's jump again to Rashiot. Peret sends us to the end of the Bamidbar. Two, Parshat Matot, verse thirty three. On page four oh four. Four oh four, the Torah tells us Ish of a man ki do neder la donai. If he makes a neder, a vow to Hashem. Oh, he shava shivua, or he swears an oath. Le sori sav and nafshom. In order to prohibit something on himself, lo yachel de vero, he should not desecrate his word, meaning he should uphold his word. Kichol he yotzim mipiv yasem. Everything that he said in his mouth, he should do. If you look at the ending letters of the words Lo Yechel Devarok Kechol, you're going to find out the word Elul again. The most important part of getting ready for Elul and Tishrei is learning how to keep your word, to be a truthful person. Our parents, I remember we once had a breath of his grandson. He was supposed to be the Sandak. And he asked his, I don't remember which child it was, but he asked the child, Is the breath going to be on time? Of course. What time is it for? Four o'clock in the afternoon. So okay, four o'clock in the afternoon. What time should I come? What time are you really going to start? No, no, no. We're starting on time. We're uh, prompt. Four o'clock. So okay, prompt. I'm going to be there four o'clock. He came four o'clock. Four fifteen. Even the parents weren't there yet, and he left. He wasn't at the breed of his family because they lied to him they said if they would have told me 4 o'clock what really means 4.15 it would be okay but they told me 4 o'clock they reiterated that it's prompt and they lied so I don't want to be with liars in a brief <laughs> what do you see? what do you see? your words your words are very important they're important <laughs> not by I'll tell you both Both my wife and I actually put us to a test that we'll never be like our rabbis 100%. Because both of our rabbis are yekis. Both, both of us are not. <laughs> no, I really am. <laughs> yeah, me too, I, because of you. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. Yeah. My, my wife's rebbe, if he says that Fila is going to be at 7, he's going to start at 6.45. If you come on time, you're going to be late. 
Oh, so Rebbe Peretz says seven, and he's there at seven. Rebbe Tenler, I remember there were times where class, the room wasn't, was empty. He said class at a certain time, he would just start teaching. Let's make a difference if anybody's here. I said class starts now, that's when class starts. Truth, truth. Shabbat Shalom. Don't say Shabbat Shalom today. Say Shabbat Shalom tomorrow night. That's Shabbat. Today is Friday. My wife is telling me, you know, Erev Yom Kippur, we used to fly to Israel. That's a crazy time to fly to Israel, the Erev Yom Kippur. I didn't mean the Erev Yom Kippur. I meant like five days before Yom Kippur. What? Five days before Yom Kippur is not Erev Yom Kippur. We have a word for that in Hebrew. It's called a Seret Yimei Tshuva. The tenets of Tshuva. Erev Yom Kippur, when you say something, be careful about what it is that you're saying. You promise somebody something, come through with your promise. You're promising Hashem you want to do Tshuva, so in... After Tishalit passes, still keep your word that you're going to do what you promised Hashem. How many of us last Yom Kippur told Hashem X, Y, and Z and we're not even close to that? Uma Silapel is the first step you have to take here. Elul, you find it alluded to, not just by Bina, perception, but by your words. Your words are important in Elul. And, and, and then our parents, in five minutes, then our parents sends us out to Tehillim. And this is a verse that most of you have been saying every day this month. Go to Psalms 27. Psalms. It's a silent P, huh? You know, in Yiddish, they call a chapter of Tehillim a capital, right? I once met an Ashkenazi rabbi who said you should not call this a capital. Because capital is a non Jewish word for chapter. Perik is a Hebrew word for chapter. It says they call prakim. In, in the Chumash, they call them perik so and so. But the Christians put that in the Chumash. We don't have chapters in our Chumash. The Christians put in the Chumash, and we follow the Christian chapters in Chumash so we would know how to argue with them. They say Isaiah so and so. We don't know what that is because we don't have chapters in Isaiah. Right, but we have to know. So we follow the Christian numerical order of, of, of the parashio. But when it comes to Tehillim, it shouldn't be capital. That should actually be a parent. That's real. So it says here in Tehillim. Let's read the end. So it's long. So you get something to wash. It's a Kamash. You need to have it tonight. Here, it's here. Had I not trusted that I would see the goodness of the land of Hashem in the land of life? Had I not believed in a Kadosh Baruch Hu, I would not have seen the goodness in the world. So this is a matter of emunah. You have to work on your emunah here. Lulei is the same letters as Elul. It's Elul backwards. And a person has to know that my obligation this month is to connect, to believe in Hashem, not just in this world, but to leave there is a next world. There is going to be another world. There is going to be a day that I see the reward, a day that I'm going to have to deal with my consequences. To believe, emuna, emuna, emuna. Now is the time to pray to Hakadosh Baruch Hu, to do tshuva to Hakadosh Baruch Hu. If you want to jump with me to one more place, Mashat Mishpatim. Find you the page number just a moment. It says here about a man who hits another man. And he dies, he shall be put to death. That's someone who's intentional. Someone intentionally killed somebody else. But if a person did not lay in ambush to kill somebody, and it happened, the word, it's a time to know that Hashem is giving you this month to run away to. All the things you did the whole year, if you fix them now, Hashem is not going to look back at it. It's a city of refuge, it's a time of peace, it's a time of... Hashem says, if you take me up on this offer, I will not remind you of the things that you did. This is the month of Elul. 
Elul is about, I'm going to give you a place to run to. Just run there. Don't, don't ignore it. It's a special thing. You have these people, they, oh, they're only Yom Kippur Jews. They only come for Yom Kippur. It's a big deal that there are Jews that still know that there's a Yom Kippur. Yeah, but even that's a big deal. There are Jews who don't know about Yom Kippur. That's already, that's already worse than that. But that's okay. At least they know that now is the time Hashem gave me to run away to. Imagine a Jew runs away, at least it comes to our Bet Knesset, it goes to another Bet Knesset. A Jew runs away to another place where they're even worse than he was the whole year. To some temple or some who knows where. It's worse than what he was doing the whole year. At least we should give people also a place to run to. And that's why before we start the prayers in Yom Kippur we say, We agree to pray, We are willing to pray with the sinners. This is today the day also for them. We let them come the synagogue as well and for the last thing for tonight the Pilots gave us a verse in Amos you know I miss this generation of rabbis the rabbis of mostly the Sparta countries the Yemenites the Tanakh was they knew by heart everywhere you go is Tanakh this Tanakh that Tanakh everything's Tanakh Everything is in the chain. Very good. Thirteen fifty six. We're actually going to go to chapter three. Eight. <laughs> says Amos the prophet if a lion roars who wouldn't be afraid Adonai Elohim Dibel if you notice it says both times Adonai Adonai but we never read Adonai Adonai if there's an Adonai that's spelled out Aleph Dalet Nun Yud and then the next words are Yud Kei Vav Kei we always read the second one Elohim Dibel when God speaks, Milo Yenabe, who's not going to prophesy? On the 1358. If you look here, the acronym of this verse, 8. 3 8. Yeah. Arye. Arye, the acronym of Arye, lion roaring. Aleph is. Eh, give me Elu. Resh is Roshana. Yud Yom Kippurim and Hey. What's the last day of judgment? Hoshana Rabba. Thank you, Rabbi. Hoshana Rabba. These are the days for a person to prepare Shuvah. Aliyah Shag. If a lion is roaring, Hashem is the lion. Hashem is saying, Hey, I'm giving you days. How could you not be afraid? How could you not be filled with awe? How could you not Yinabe, reach a level of prophecy? I'll tell you today, you don't know. You don't know how important this time of Elul is. It's important to remember all over the Tanakh. All over the Tanakh. And if this is what our parents wrote, this would mean there's a lot more that he wasn't willing to put on paper. If these are the allusions to Elul in the Tanakh, you have to be aware that this means that the Elul is a deep month. Elul is a big deal. And this is our time to make it big with Hashem. And we have to take a seize the opportunity, seize the day, as it says. Elul is a non-Jewish word. You know the dates of the months; they're all non-Jewish months. They're not. It's like January. The reason why our rabbis kept these months is because they realized that in these months are hidden secrets that the non-Jews who invented them didn't know. In our Torah, the months only have numbers. As Lubavitcher Rebbe points out, the month Iyar, Iyar, for example, also it's a, it's a non-Jewish word. But the acronym is Ani Adonai Rofecha. I am God, your healer. And if you look in the books of Kabbalah, the month of Iyar is actually very much connected to healing. And so, we, they didn't know. There's a verse in the, in the Talmud that says, Geder mitnabe ve'no yodeh. There are some people who are in the, in the status of they prophesied, but they didn't know that they were prophesying. 
Hashem allowed them to say things that they didn't truly understand what they were saying. Not like our prophets who knew what they were going to say and they said it. But these they said something and said, oh, if he said it, it must be that it means something. Elul, it's a deep time. Imagine, you take advantage of this time. Make the most of it. Learn books on Shuvah. If you want the easiest book that you can access for Shuvah, you have it in English for free on the internet, the Rambam's book on Shuvah. Go to Mishneh Torah, find it online, Chabad.org has, Machon uh, Mamre on the internet has, put in the laws of Shuvah for the Rambam. It's a good number of chapters, it will change your life. It's in the Mishnah Torah. Yes, one of them is the laws of Shuvah, and they're online. Take it, read it, know it, understand it, be ready. And you know, they have a saying in the Boy Scouts, be prepared. Not so long, very pretty short, a few chapters. Uh, in an email. That's a good idea. It's a good idea. I like that idea. Okay. It's a time to, to really internalize Shuvah. It's a different year. It's a new year. For us as a community, it's a new beginning. It's a very new beginning. And if we want to make it good, we want to make it right, we have to together do Shuvah. And as I spoke about in Rav Kook's class on Monday and Tuesday, there's a collective Shuvah of the whole world, a collective Shuvah of all the nations of Israel, and a specific individualistic Shuvah that we have. Let's make Shuvah right. Let's connect Hashem out of love. Let's connect Hashem by removing... Anything that is making our heart numb, that is making our heart not willing to connect. And let's really find that day where we'll say, Anila Dodi Vidodili, that I am to my beloved and my beloved is to me, that we reach the point where Hashem and us are in a mutual relationship, where we both love each other and expect the same things from each other, and we actually get where it is that we want.